I need a miracle. I'm guessing every one of us has said it at one time or another. Whatever we're facing, whether we're driving on fumes, watching that needle on E, praying that God will multiply the gas in our car, just like He did the loaves and fishes so many years ago, or maybe it is in school, like Scotty joked about last week, sitting in his calculus test. We've all done it. Like I remember when I was in Bible college, I had a professor who would pass out the tests, and before we started, he would always pray, Lord, reward these students according to their level of preparation. And there were times when I was praying, no, Lord, that is a terrible prayer. Please ignore him. What I need right now is mercy, mercy, Lord. Well, there are times we pray for small miracles, like a good parking spot at the mall this time of year or that the Seahawks' defense will finally get their act together enough to get us back to the Super Bowl. But of course, sometimes we pray for bigger miracles. God, I need you to heal my loved one. I need this biopsy to come back clear. God, help me to keep my sobriety. God, I need you to restore my marriage. God, I don't know how I'm going to make my rent. God, I feel so alone. I just want someone to share my life with. I need a miracle. And as we're approaching Christmas this year, we're talking about miracles. Because I believe God is a God of miracles. I've seen it. Not just in the miracle stories that we read about in this book, but in the lives of people that I've known in my own life. And I can't explain why some miracles happen and others don't. But today, I want to talk about a miracle that is there for the asking, and it can change everything for anyone. No matter who you are or what you've done, this miracle is for you. And I want to walk through a moment in the life of Jesus that we read about at the end of Luke chapter 7. It's Luke 7, verses 36 to 50. And if you have a Bible, you can turn there or you can follow along as I read it here. Now, Luke writes one of the four accounts of the life of Jesus in the New Testament, and he tells about a time that Jesus was invited over for dinner, starting in verse 36. It says, when one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. That's how they sat at dinner. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited Jesus saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who's touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner." Now, there's so much happening here in this story, so let me give you a little bit of context. This Pharisee, who's one of the religious elites in Jesus' day, we find out a little later in the story that this Pharisee's name is Simon. Simon invites Jesus to his house for this dinner party, and we don't know the whole motivation behind why he invited Jesus over, but when you start putting the details together of what happens, you realize this is not a couple of friends getting together for a meal. There are a lot of things that you would normally do for a guest who had come to your home to make them feel welcome in this culture that for whatever reason, Simon just doesn't do for Jesus. So this isn't a relaxed, laid-back dinner. There's tension here. It's also important to know that Jewish dinner parties in the first century were very different from the kind of dinner parties we might have today. See, back then at a dinner party, the house would be sort of open. Often these meals would happen in an outdoor courtyard to accommodate more people. And all those people weren't there to eat. Most of them were there to observe. And pretty much anyone who wanted to come in and observe could slip in, sit along the wall, and just listen to the conversation. Now, this is very different from now, of course. You remember way back when we could actually sit down to eat in a restaurant without any masks or distancing? I mean, it's only been 10 months, but way back then, it would sometimes happen when people from North Shore would see us out, maybe with the family or with our friends, and they would come over to the table and they'd say hello. And I love that. It's always fun to run into people who are part of North Shore, even now. Even when it's hard to recognize each other with the masks on, it's still so great to see one who's, someone who's part of this church and to just, just get a chance to say hi. But if you were out to eat 
and someone came to the table and just sort of pulled up a seat and sat down and said, hey, don't mind me. You go ahead and eat. I just want to listen in on your conversation. I mean, that would be weird, right? See, in Jesus' day, that's sort of the way it worked. People would come, they would observe this dinner party, and they would listen to the conversation. So it's not odd that this uninvited woman shows up for the party. What does stand out is who this woman is. And what we're told in Scripture is that she lives a sinful life. Now, most commentators believe most likely she was a prostitute. Now, I want you to imagine for just a moment this woman who lives in a very strict, highly religious culture, something more like you would see in many Middle Eastern countries today. Imagine how people would respond to her, given her background. And this woman, extremely well-known around town for all the wrong reasons. And you know, every time she walks by, heads turn. People talk. See, she lives in a culture where even the most respected women had very few rights. But she isn't respected at all. She's shunned. She's judged. She's pushed away. So you have this woman who's just broken. And in this story, in the presence of Jesus, there is something about Jesus that moves her, that draws her in. The two of them seem to have so little in common, but somehow she senses he is different from any man she's met before. Chances are she'd heard him teaching, maybe in the village synagogue or somewhere else, and she's so moved by what he says, how he talks about God, she wants to meet him. He seems unlike any other man she's ever known. She senses his love, his grace, and when she's finally able to get near him at this dinner party, she loses it. She starts to cry. And she's crying so hard that her tears literally wet Jesus' feet as he's reclined there at the table. And she instinctively unbinds her hair, lets it down, and uses her hair to dry and wipe his feet. And then she has some expensive perfume. And this is an act of honor, something you would do for a guest. She anoints him with the perfume. She just pours a little on him. She's just overcome. Now, when she does this, I promise you that everything at this dinner party stopped because everybody's shocked. Everybody is sitting there, mouth hanging open. Can you believe what she just did? I mean, this is a major party foul in this day and that one, of course. Nobody would know what to say or do. You ever been in one of those moments, one of those times when somebody does something so outrageous, so embarrassing, so awkward that nobody really knows what to do next? Many years ago, I was on staff at another church, and we were having a Thanksgiving service. It was a very large church, in fact, 3,000-seat auditorium, and the place was packed for this celebration. Well, the plan was, a few times throughout the service, sort of woven between the singing, we would have sort of a roving open microphone in the congregation, and people would have a chance to say things that they were thankful for. And people talked about how God had blessed them in all kinds of beautiful ways. It was going great, a very moving experience for all of us. And then I remember, as one of the people who had a microphone, I saw a lady who raised her hand and wanted to share. And so I ran over with the mic, and she stood up, she grabbed the microphone out of my hand and held it, and she said, in this room full of 3,000 people, I'm thankful for my marriage this year because my husband and I have been able to heal and rebuild our relationship even though last year he had an affair with that woman sitting right over there. And she pointed to someone a few rows over. I got to tell you, it was one of the most awkward moments I have ever been a part of in my life. And I don't remember anything else she said. All I could think was, how am I going to get this microphone back from this lady? We were all in shock. What do you do? I'll tell you one thing. That was the last time we did an open microphone sharing in any service I was a part of. Anyway, sometimes things like that happen in a public setting that just sort of leaves everybody speechless, having no idea what to do. That's what's happening here, okay? Everything stops. And so Simon, who's the host of this gathering, he has a few thoughts that cross his mind. First of all, he can't believe this is happening. He's shocked like everybody else. He can't believe this woman is even in his house, this woman who he sees as such a sinner. If just this woman's touch was enough to defile a good person. And not only is she there, 
but he can hardly believe what she's done, touching Jesus. I mean, again, you have to understand in this religious culture, it was grounds for divorce for a woman to let down her hair in the presence of a man that wasn't her husband. This is next level, though. This is scandalous. And not only is he shocked by what this woman has done, he's shocked at Jesus' response. He can't believe that Jesus doesn't jump up and condemn her. Can't believe that he doesn't tell her to leave or push her away. I mean, how in the world could this guy be a prophet? How could this guy claim to be sent from God? I mean, surely, if he was a true man of God, he would have more discernment than to allow this to happen. See, everything in Simon's religious culture had taught him that you protect goodness by avoiding sinful people, right? That's how this works. Good people protect their goodness by pushing away all the sinful people. And I think if you pushed Simon, I think even Simon would probably admit that he was a sinner, but not a sinner like her. I mean, this woman's in another league. See, Simon believed he was qualitatively different than this woman. He might have been a little sinner, but she was a big sinner, big leagues. And this kind of plays out in our life, this attitude. You ever go to make a critical statement about another person? And almost always, before you say what you think of them, you'll say something like, now I know I'm not perfect, but... And then you go on to talk about what it is you think they do wrong. You're saying, no, 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 I know I'm a little sinner, but what they do, oh, that's next level. They're big time. So Simon thinks to himself that Jesus must not know who it is that's touching him. But of course, Jesus knows exactly who this woman is. He knows exactly what she's done. And Jesus knows who Simon is, of course, and what he's thinking. So Jesus tells a story that both explains the woman's attitude and at the same time exposes Simon's. Take a look, beginning again in verse 40 of Luke chapter 7. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. I'm all ears. Two people owed money to a certain moneylender, one owed him 500 denarii, the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon replied, well, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You've judged correctly, Jesus said. Now, Jesus often uses little parables like this to make a point, and here's the idea he's trying to get across. These two people, they owe this moneylender money. Two people in debt who have no resources. So the question of which of them has the greater debt at this point is purely academic. It's actually beside the point. Because if you don't have any money, it really doesn't matter if you owe $20,000 or $200,000. You have no ability to pay back the debt. And both people in this story are absolutely broke. And Jesus is making the parallel spiritually. In a spiritual sense, none of us can pay back our debt. In a spiritual sense, every single one of us are spiritually bankrupt. The Bible says there's no one righteous, not even one, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We have no ability on our own to pay back the sin debt that we have to God. Now, how big our debt, how great our sin, it's completely beside the point, really. So the question isn't who has the bigger debt or who's the bigger sinner. The question is, is there any help? Is there any hope? What can be done? See, whether your debt is tiny or gigantic, if you can't pay it back, you can't pay it back. So in that sense, there's no difference between Simon and this woman. That's what Simon can't see. There's no difference really between any of us. We're all spiritually in debt and unable to pay it back. Well, Jesus says this moneylender does the unbelievable. He offers to cancel the debt. It's an act of grace because he doesn't require the men in the story to work and earn back the portion that they owe. It's an act of freedom because he doesn't just extend the repayment period of time. He just wipes it clean. Their debt is paid. It's forgiven. And Jesus is pointing to something we all need to remember. The very heart of God, 
He's revealing something so important about who God is and how he sees us. That the size of the debt is beside the point. The question is, what will we do about it? Well, this woman decides what she's going to do. She comes crying to Jesus, recognizing her debt, her need for a fresh start, her need for forgiveness. And the idea that this God would be willing to forgive her, to love her, to accept her, that would be a miracle. And the very idea of it moves her to tears. And then Jesus asks Simon a question. Beginning of verse 44, he says, Jesus turned toward the woman and said to Simon the Pharisee, do you see this woman? It's a great question. Because truth is, Simon doesn't really see her at all, does he? He says, Simon, do you see this woman? I don't know that you do. Because what you see is a person that you've frozen in their past. You've labeled, you've pigeonholed, you've defined by their mistakes. It's one of the greatest things about Jesus. You see this all throughout the Gospels. When Jesus interacted with somebody, he did not see them for who they were in that moment or in their past. See, with Jesus, a person's past is not their future. He doesn't see them for their mistakes or their struggles. When he looks at a person, what he sees is who they could become, who they were meant to be. Now, for a lot of us, maybe that consider ourselves to be sort of religious in some form or fashion, we tend to do the opposite, don't we? We tend to want to belittle people. We tend to want to focus on their brokenness, their struggles, instead of our own brokenness. And what Jesus is saying is, do you see this woman as a human being? Do you see her as someone who's been created in the image of God, that is known and loved by Him? Simon didn't. Couldn't see past her sin, but Jesus could. And so he goes on. Second half of verse 44. Do you see this woman? Jesus says, I came into your house and you did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not not stopped kissing my feet. Kissing would have been a traditional greeting in that time. Verse 46, you did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. Essentially, what Jesus is saying is that this woman gets it better than Simon does. She recognizes her need for grace. Simon doesn't. She admits she's spiritually bankrupt. Simon won't, not really. And because of this, a miracle has taken place. This woman, whose life has been defined by her sin, has a whole new identity. Her debt has been paid. And because she understands just how overwhelming and transformational and complete His love and forgiveness are, because she's honest about the spiritual bankruptcy in her life, she can't help herself but be thankful to worship to honor him, tears streaming down her cheeks. She's just overcome with love because of what he's done. And Jesus says there's a connection between our own awareness of our spiritual bankruptcy, our need for forgiveness, and our capacity to love. I've seen it. The people I know who have the most vibrant life with God, the most authentic joy and gratitude and love in their lives, they are the ones who are the most honest about their own spiritual bankruptcy, the forgiveness that they've received, no matter how big their debt. They don't wallow in it, but they acknowledge it. And on the flip side, many people who seem to struggle to love, who seem to have very little joy or gratitude, very often they seem to sometimes take their forgiveness for granted. They seem to have forgotten just how much they've been forgiven. Well, look at verse 48. Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. And the other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? 
And then Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. And for the first time in who knows how long, a man has made her feel clean and loved instead of dirty and used. And she's going to leave this house, and for the first time, it doesn't matter what everybody on the street says about her, because she knows deep down in her heart, this man has set her free. She's not who she used to be. She's going to leave this house, and everything is different. And she walks out knowing that she's at peace, and that the creator of the universe is actually her friend. She leaves that house different than when she came in because she had been in the presence of Jesus. And I believe there are some watching right now who need the very same thing. I mean, maybe you can relate to this woman. You know you've made mistakes in life. There have been things that you've done that you've carried with you for years that you're so ashamed of. And you wonder, could this be true? Is it really possible for you to experience the miracle that this woman did? To be set free from your past? To once and for all have those things washed away, your debt canceled, paid for by Jesus, filled with His peace? See, friends, that is possible. Your past is not your future. And today is your day. It's possible for you to experience the miracle of forgiveness and to experience His peace. It really is. Or maybe you're more like Simon in this story. You'd admit you've made some mistakes, but but you think you're not as bad as those people, right? That somehow your spiritual debt isn't as big a deal as theirs. That somehow that makes you better than other people whose sins you see as bigger or uglier. Maybe you've forgotten just how much you've been forgiven. I've done it. It's easy to do. Many of us who've been Christians for a while can slip into this. I had an experience early in my ministry that made me think about this in a whole different way. Some of you know for the first couple years of my ministry, I served in a large church in Las Vegas, and I led a college and young adult ministry there in the heart of Sin City. And we saw all kinds of amazing new beginnings in that group. So many stories, miracles I could tell. It's incredible. But one of the most difficult, gut-wrenching moments in my ministry came when I got a call that one of the guys in our group, a guy named Mike, he'd been driving home from being the best man in his brother's wedding. And at the reception, he'd gotten drunk. And driving home, going way too fast, Mike ran a red light, smashed directly into the side of a car coming the other direction. And in that car were a father with his teenage son. And it so often seems to happen in these tragic moments. Mike was virtually unharmed, but the father and son were killed instantly. It was horrible. And I don't have time to tell you the entire story, but when that trial finally began, Mike's family asked if I would come sit with them in the courtroom. And I'll be honest, I didn't want to go. But they said they really wanted, needed someone to be there to support them, to help them. So I agreed. And I will never forget sitting in that courtroom the day of Mike's sentencing. I was sitting next to his mom and his brother, and Mike was right in front of us with his lawyer at the table there. And I remember sitting in that courtroom, listening to the prosecutor describe the awful thing that Mike had done, hearing from the family members and friends of the victims, And I remember being so disgusted by this kid. I remember being so embarrassed that I was sitting on his side of the courtroom instead of on the other side with the victim's families. And the more I looked at the back of his head, the more disgusted I got. What he did was disgusting. And I remember when I was sitting there, I won't say I heard an audible voice or anything like that, but I remember looking at Mike and sensing God asking me a similar question to what Jesus asked Simon in this story. Do you see this man? Do you see him? Yes, what he did is horrible, disgusting. There's no excuse for the awful thing he did. 
And yes, he deserves punishment for his actions, and he received the maximum sentence for his crime, as he should have. But I remember this sense that God was asking me, do you see him like I see him? Do you see him as more than his sin, which is inexcusable? But don't you know I died on the cross for his sins just like I died for yours? Now, the consequences of the sin might be different, and those consequences were deserved. Justice matters. The size of the debt might be different, but that's not the point. Both of you are spiritually broke. Neither of you can pay back what you owe. And I died to forgive Mike just like I died to forgive you. Now, you may think that's over the top, that there's no comparison between a guy who drove drunk and killed two people and someone like me. Friend, I know the truth. I know my pride, my envy, my selfishness, my materialism, my self-righteousness, my impulse to say things that make me look better than I really am and to hide the things that are embarrassing or bad and so many more dark things in my heart. I know the truth about me. So does God. And I know I can be a Simon like in this story. And regardless of the size of my debt, what I need, what Simon needed, what this woman needed, what Mike needed, what you need is the amazing grace that only Jesus offers. A grace that doesn't brush off our sin or pretend it doesn't matter. Justice matters. Wrong must be punished. But it's a grace that is willing to take the spiritual punishment for that sin off our shoulders and place it on His. See, it cost the man who's owed in Jesus' parable real money to forgive the debts of those guys. And it costs Jesus to forgive ours. Because when He came as that baby born in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago, as we'll celebrate on Christmas in just a few weeks, He didn't just come to teach us how to be better people or how to live a better life. He came to lay down His life for us, to pay the debt that we were too spiritually bankrupt to pay ourselves. And when Jesus went to that cross, He took that woman's sin and Simon's sin and Mike's sin and my sin and your sin to that cross with Him. And He offers the miracle of forgiveness, the miracle of a new beginning. There may be consequences, there may be damage, but spiritually speaking, our debt is paid, our past forgiven, our future defined by His love and His grace. That's what we remember when we celebrate the Lord's Supper or communion together. And we're actually going to be doing that again today at our drive through communion experience here on our Kirkland campus this afternoon. And if you can get here, if you're in the area, I hope you'll come over today to remember between one and three to be reminded, to celebrate and thank Him for the price that He paid for us. We'd love to see you here. But right now, I want to challenge you to embrace that forgiveness today. Because like every gift, it's not really yours until you open it and claim it for yourself. I mean, how silly would it be to find a gift under the tree later this month, but never open it? Just look at it, admire how pretty it is, but never actually open it for yourself. And there are a lot of people who've done that. They hear about the miracle of forgiveness, but they've never actually opened that gift for themselves. And maybe that's you. Friend, you need to open that gift today. You need to claim it for yourself today. No matter how big or small your debt might be, you need to ask Him to pay it all, to cancel it, to forgiveness, to forgive it. That's the promise, friends. That's the miracle God wants to work in your life. The miracle of a forgiven life, a clean conscience, the freedom, the joy, the absolute assurance of knowing your debt is paid because of what the angel said to Joseph back at that first Christmas when he said, Mary will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus. Because why? He will save his people from their sins. See, maybe you know what it feels like to be Mike. Maybe there are some terrible things in your past. The crime, the affair, the abortion, the accident, 
the mistake, the failure, the sin. And maybe there's some part of you that wonders, is this real? Could it really be true that God knows everything I've ever done, even that mistake that you struggle to forgive in yourself? Friends, it's true. As Jesus' follower John wrote, if we confess our sins, he says, God is faithful and just and will forgive our sins, purify us from all unrighteousness. That's the good news, friends. No matter who you are, where you've been, what you've done, Jesus offers you the miracle of forgiveness. Your past doesn't have to be your future. It's time for a new beginning because your debt is paid. Your future can be marked by love and gratitude just like it was for that woman at that dinner that night. So whether you're more like Simon or more like Mike or somewhere in between, today is your day. You can celebrate this Christmas forgiven by that one who was born in Bethlehem. And so I want to ask you to bow your head with me right now. Let's, let's pray together. Would you pray with me? I want to invite some of you to pray this and just echo this prayer along with me. Simple prayer boils down to three things. Sorry, thank you, and please. And maybe you want to say this prayer after me. God, I'm sorry. I admit my spiritual debt before you. I know I can never repay it on my own. And so thank you. Thank you for being willing to come and take my place, to give your life, to pay my debt. So please, please forgive me, Lord. Please come into my life and fill me with your peace. Teach me to walk with you. Sorry, thank you, please. And if you've prayed that today, a miracle has taken place. Your debt has been paid. Your past has been forgiven. You have a fresh start. And very often when people embrace this gift of God's grace in the New Testament, they express that decision by being baptized. And we'd love to have you as part of that. We're planning to celebrate some baptisms coming up in January, and we'd love to have you be part of it. You can text North Shore to 97000. Even do it right now. Text North Shore to 97000 to let somebody know that you're opening that gift of forgiveness in your life. And we'll be in touch about how you can be part of that baptism experience. If, if you haven't done that, it, now's the time. So God, I thank you. I thank you for saving someone like me with my debt, with my sin. I thank you for your forgiveness. And just like that woman who was so overcome by your grace that she couldn't help but express her love, I want to do the same. I love you, Jesus. I thank you for loving me. And I ask you to fill me with your peace. Thank you for paying the price for me. And I say, praise the one who paid my debt and raised my life up from the dead. It's in his name that I pray. And everyone who agreed with the prayer said,